In today's video, we're going to go over some creepy TikTok conspiracies. Let's get into it. This is part five of some of the most horrifying semicanophobia things I've ever seen. This is called the drowning girl. She is absolutely massive, as you can see, so that also triggers some megalophobia. She is in Bilbao, Spain, and she is absolutely massive, just sticking out of the water like that. The drowning girl is supposed to spark a discussion about rising water levels, global warming, things like that, but it is just absolutely horrifying, just chilling in that water like that. Could you ever go near this thing? Look how massive it is being lowered into the water with a crane. Ugh, heebie-jeebies, I can't. Man, that is disturbing and kind of cool at the same time, I'm not gonna lie. I can only imagine 50,000 years from now when someone discovers that they're gonna think that it was something we were idolizing or something, like it was a god. Or people might even think that aliens put it there. Do any of you guys have submechanophobia? Because I'm not gonna lie, I get creeped out by some things in water. This is not quite one of them, but there is things out there. Okay, so that there, right here, that's our light yeah. that says let's get spooky, which is in... Whole, the next room, a whole other room. A whole other room, and you see Joe go into the room, and now he is inside of the room, and he's waving his hand across it. But I can't see that, and there's nothing it's reflecting. Solid wall. There is a solid wall. So Another. why can I see into my room? Wave one more time. Why is that happening? And then, so here we go. We walk into the room, Mike, and here we are. You shouldn't be able to see you shouldn't that, be able to see that from the window, this right? Now, show this, show, show here. This side. No, show this side of the room too. Yeah, so yeah. Not, not There's like nothing here. here. There's no mirrors. So why can we see that light? In the window. On in the, the window. The in a whole different room. That's a pretty good question. I honestly really do not know if there isn't a window where that light is and there's no outer porch to reflect off of another window. Maybe the only guess that I have is when they entered the room, they didn't show us the left side. There could have been like a dresser like this right here that had a, a mirror on it and it was reflecting off that mirror and at the right angle, you could probably see the reflection off that window. That's my only guess. Let me know in the comments what you guys think it could be, or do you think that maybe it's just a hoax and they're just doing some video editing? I don't really think that it's video editing, but I do think it is an optical illusion of some sort. There's a glitch in the matrix with this mirror, man. What is happening? It took me a minute to get this. I was like, okay, what's going on in this picture? The shoe, the shoe is the same way. Look, it's facing the same way, whether it is in the mirror or not. And he moves his foot to the other side to like prove like, hey, look, my feet are right in the mirror, but the shoe's not. And then he even touches the mirror to show you like, this is a, this is a good one, man. I don't think that that shoe's real. It kind of looks fake to me. I know I'm the crazy conspiracy guy. I get it. I'm going to try and keep it together for this one. I got, I think we might have found it. I think we might have found the time traveler. And if you haven't seen this video yet, this guy down here goes into a shed and disappears. And then the next day, this guy walks out of the shed. When I first saw this video, I thought it was just fake. I thought it was a joke. I thought it was some sort of skit. So much so that I stitched it with like a silly little I'm a time traveler thing. But I've gone through it and I can't, I can't figure it out. If it is a hoax, it's done well. But I also kind of think it's possible that there's a portal in the guy's shed. Like, I know, I know it sounds crazy, but have you seen the show 112263? I always liked that show, but it always bothered me that the time portal was in a pantry in a diner. Like, wouldn't they have figured that out when they built the pantry? But I guess, like, they're maybe... I don't know. But it's, it's like the same principle as what happened to the gentleman in the shed. Like, he went in as, like, what? Late mid to late 20s came out early to mid 60s so he might have spent 40 years in there like well in the past and he's wearing modern clothes so he could have brought like his backpack could have had a change of clothes in it for when he came back to the future but what did what did he change 
Because let's say he went back to 1960, spent 40 years, then he would have come back in 2000, like come back to 2024 in 2000. But I'm convinced that it's the same guy because unless they're just really closely related, they have the same walk, the same mannerisms, the same facial structure. I don't know, I think it's pretty close. So if he's from this timeline, if he comes back to 2024, somebody's got to recognize him. Like, I mean, it's a, not the clearest picture, but somebody, somebody has to know who he is. But we also have to start looking in the past. Like, he couldn't have left no footprint. There has to be a picture of him or a story about him or something. Like, he can't have just done nothing for 30 or 40 years. There's got to be something history-wise that proves he was there. I don't... It, start in Florida. That's where the guy's Airbnb is. But anyway, internet, do your thing. Come on, guys. Let's, we need to find this guy. We just need to find him and ask him some questions. That's all we need to do. Also, um, can somebody find out where that Airbnb is, where the shed is located? Because... um. Want to try something? This happened almost two weeks ago, and I'm still seeing videos about it on TikTok. I do not think that it was a purposely done hoax. I do think that someone went in there and someone came out. Whether it was a potential drug deal or some kind of exchange, I don't know. But there was definitely something going on there. And unless the ring camera had a 24-hour surveillance on it where it could just record that long, which I don't think ring does that. They record segments at a time. Who's to say that the... The younger guy didn't walk into the shed, and as soon as the ring camera went off, he walked out, and it just didn't have enough time to alert the ring system. But then, why didn't the ring system go off when the older guy went into the building before he came out, you know? There's just a number of questions that I have about it that I, I don't think we'll ever truly get the answer to. Could it be time travel? Could it have been a drug deal? We'll probably never know. Let me know what you guys think, and if there's been any further updates, let me know as well, because there might have actually been an update and I just haven't seen it yet, but I don't think there has been. Hey, if you haven't done so already, Go ahead and like the video and subscribe to the channel. I only ask once per video and I make a video like this almost every day. And to everyone that's subscribed and or watching, thank you so much for being a part of this channel. And I'm really sorry if I sound extremely nasally, if my face is really red and like my nose is red. I am sick. I'm trying to push through it. It's not weighing me down too much, but I am sick. So if I sound a little different, look a little different, I'm really sorry about that. I was doing some research on the New York City subway stations. And it's interesting because they said that the subway stations were founded in 1904 and they opened in 1905. So they were found, that's, that's what founded means, they were found in 1904 and they opened one year later. They didn't build them, they just took ownership of these tunnels that are deep underneath New York City. And it's interesting because when you look at all of these tunnels, you sit there and think, okay, you go up above on the, on the, on the street, you got horse and wagon and all the stuff roaming around, but you're building these massive tunnels cutting through the earth. Take a perfect example. Go outside, get a shovel, and see how far you can go in the earth, especially in a time around the 1900s where it's very challenging to do that. There's still construction photos. There's just like four people standing in front of a tunnel saying that we built it. You would think if you did the first subway ever that people are blown away that they could go in, you'd have photos galore. But you only have one photo of four people standing in front of a tunnel saying that you found or founded the, the tunnels of New York City. They are destroying a garden that we use to feed ourselves, that we use to feed the community. A garden, bro. Nothing but nature. Nothing but food. Free food. A homeless dude builds himself an underground cave and what do we do? We evict him. We can't have him living off the land for free. You want to feed the homeless out in the streets? We're going to fine you. We can't have you feeding people for free without permission. That doesn't benefit us. We need you to eat our food. We need you to live in the houses we built for you. We need you completely dependent on us. That's the message I'm getting here. Yeah, that's a shame. If that really was a community garden and it's just getting destroyed like that, that's that's a horrible shame. 
It, it also, though, makes me wonder, was that garden allowed to be there in that spot or was it a part of a public park and they decided to turn it into a garden who gave them the right to come up and rip up this garden if it was okay to be there what makes it not okay to be there aside that it's just free food going to the public it just makes me wonder if there was some kind of permit that was not granted or this is not a privately owned property where someone has the right to put a garden on and it's in a city at it maybe a public park or something i would like a little bit more context to this video but other than that yeah it really sucks for all of those reasons to find us especially feeding homeless people like what in the world why would you find me for giving my food away that I paid for to somebody else? That's, that's crazy to me. I have told you that the Bible was rewritten by the bad guys, and yet I'm constantly referencing it for what I claim to be extremely important truths. This may seem counterintuitive, but let me explain. Number one, and I'm going to keep saying this till everyone says it with me. The Bible is not a book. That is, it is not a cohesive document. It is an amalgamation, a collection of various writings throughout history, thousands of years, thousands of people, thousands of miles. When David was writing the Psalms, or when Moses was lamenting in Deuteronomy, they weren't thinking that, oh, I'm adding to the Bible right now. They were just writing of their own experiences. They were writing poetry, they were writing prayers, and they were writing historical accounts of what happened to them. This is true of every single writing that is in the Bible. None of them were thinking they were adding to a book called the Bible. Now, the Old Testament is a cohesive document, and it's essentially Jewish record keeping. And the Hebrew version of the Old Testament is still extremely accurate. And within the Old Testament is not only one of the richest true histories of human beings, but also many important understandings of science, spirituality, supernatural, and magic. The issue is, is that although we have things like the Greek Septuagint, which by the way was one of the most impressive amassing of religious and scholarly minds to come together to translate all of the Abrahamic text from Hebrew into Greek, since then the translations have been very bad. To give you an idea of what it really requires to translate these ancient texts into more modern religions, they took hundreds if not thousands of Hebrew Greek scholars and they would all sit down and sometimes all write the same page of translation and then they would check each other and if one word was off, they would all have to start over. That type of meticulous attention to detail, well that was the last time that that happened. So anything that was cohesive about the Bible, the Old Testament, which is Jewish record keeping, we lost that as well when we translated from Greek. Then we get into the New Testament, and that's where we run into a lot of problems, except they do it really smart. They sneak in those lies amidst the truth, which in Russian is called krivda, crooked truth. This is where we get into a sort of the proof is in the pudding and the truth is the truth and the truth is beheld. When you read something in the Bible and it makes perfect sense because it makes sense to the human being. It makes sense when you test it out in the world. When Christ says, my father is in heaven, I worship the good God literally because I speak truth. What he's saying is when you're a good person. You're in the favor of God. You're worshiping God because you're doing good. So therefore, things like lying, when you lie, that's literally a worship of the devil, right? He breaks it down very simply. That's how we know it's true because it's obvious. Like when we really actually think about what he's saying, it's obvious, right? When Christ is about to get his feet washed and he says, no, wait a second, let me wash your feet. Christ is showing us the importance of service and a leader should be the servant, right? These are obvious truths once we really dig into them. Now, when the Bible starts going off about this nonsense about Christ shedding his blood for our sins, one, we can test that by again going back to the Greek Septuagint. Because John 3.16 in Greek does not talk about God so loving the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's not in there. That's not what it says. It only says that once it got changed over to Latin, German, and English. And that's how we know they're lying because the Greek Septuagint is a thousand times more credible and accurate than anything that came after it. So if we're going to rely on something for its truth, it's going to have to be in the Greek, Aramaic, Arabic, and Hebrew. Not to mention, anybody shedding their blood for somebody else's sins is black magic. And again, the truth is the truth. That's easy to behold. So we actually have to have a lot of discernment when reading this corrupted text. 
Here's another great example for you, okay? There's sort of a threefold God in the Abrahamic religion. There is Ruach, okay? There is Elohim, or Lord, and then there is YHVH. Not Yahweh, it's not the same thing, YHVH. By the way, this is where we can really prove that there was a lot of mistranslation and confusion. You see, they collapsed all these three very different concepts of God or gods into one. So when you read in the Bible, Jehovah or Yahweh or Elohim or Lord or the spirit in the beginning that spoke the word and the word became flesh, you think that's all one thing. Now, I'm not saying you specifically, but I'm saying people in general, that's what they think. They think all of those words are one thing. And sometimes really bad translations of the Bible will basically use the same word for all those things. Again, that's a mistranslation. That comes from the German word Gott, G-O-T-T, -T, which collapsed all those words into one thing we call God. So in the original meaning, Ruach, the Hebrew word, means breath and spirit simultaneously. It's like the living force of creation. And it's in the microcosm and the macrocosm. The macrocosm, it's the expansion of all of reality. Right? It's the, it's the spirit of God. It's the word frequencies that become flesh. It's the same thing as the Big Bang. And then when we breathe the breath, we also pull in the spirit, the Holy Spirit, or the chi, which is carried on the air, which is some sort of electromagnetic phenomenon that is actually literally in the air molecules. That's one thing. Then you have the Elohim, which was a council of higher beings. These are probably some sort of extraterrestrial, superterrestrial, or supernatural beings or phenomenon. Then we have YHVH, the Tetragrammaton, which is a wholly different concept. This is the hyperdimensional geometric lattice of creation. It is like the superstructure which allows, you know, things to exist and makes a strawberry the size that it is. And it doesn't get any bigger than that because it's locked into these geometric patterns in superspace, which is not Yahweh. Yahweh is a new conception. It was a created character about 100 or 200 years ago that was based off a storm deity we call Baal, which was mixed with Moloch, and they brung in a little Dagon in there too. Now people think Yahweh is the same thing as YHVH. Yahweh, at his best, was a fictional warlord, maniac, narcissist, psychopath that pretended to be God and punished anyone who didn't worship him. Then we got the Council of Nicaea. Then we got some real problems, right? Because you may not know this, but there was a heated debate on whether or not Christ was a God who became man or a man who became God. There was a lot of credible, intelligent, and well-read scholars that believe Christ attained enlightenment, that he was a mere man just like any of us who reached Godhood through meditation, through prayer, through righteous action. And then there was this other side that said, no, that was God incarnate. A man could never do something like that. And guess who was on that side? Constantine. The Pharisees. The same ones that all set up Christ to die. Just happened to be the ones that say that you can't be like him, even though Christ said that you could be like him. This is where we catch the lie. They weren't going to rewrite the whole thing to be garbage and nonsense. That would defeat the purpose of Krivda. The crooked truth. There has to be a lot of truth in there for them to slip in the most important lie they're trying to disseminate. And that is the lie that Jesus Christ bled for your sins. The lie that you couldn't become Christ yourself and that your sins were your responsibility. The truth is that anytime you use something else that is innocent and cause it pain or unalive it, for your own mistakes, it is evil, it is black magic, no matter how they try to tell the story. And the truth is, there are many yogis that have attained light bodies, resurrection bodies, just like Christ. And so it is attainable by human beings, and that's why Christ says, you will do far greater things than I. That rings true. What Christ actually said rings true. And it feels good. And it empowers us. And it puts the responsibility in each individual to do the right thing. Not to mess up all week and then go Sunday in confession and eat your cracker and drink your wine and be like, everything's okay because, you know, Jesus has got it. That, on the face of it, sounds insane. It sounds ridiculous. It sounds like a lie. The truth is the truth. The truth feels right. The truth feels good. Not just in some kind of hedonistic way. It feels like, oh, I'm doing the right thing. 
So you can't just read the text and assume everything you're being told is the truth. You have to study the text. You have to discern the text. You have to really critically think about what it's telling you or what it's trying to tell to you. And this is always how human beings have found truth through critical thinking, investigation, observation. Wow, I actually found this really interesting. There's a lot of stuff in here that I've never heard before and a couple of things that I've always kind of wanted to know that I never really went out of my way to look up. But I'm probably going to do some research after this. I didn't know that there was people like that many people that actually went through and studied all those ancient texts to convert it for accuracy. That's a really cool thing to know. And I've often wondered if the Bible was manipulated in a way that worked in the favor of somebody else and it's not actually a true story. But it came from an actual true story. It's just been heavily manipulated. This was pretty interesting. I'm not going to say that I'm 100% on board with it. I need to do a little bit more studying. I would really like to know what all your opinions are because this was a new one to me that really interested me and now I'm pretty curious about going through here and then looking some things up. If anyone has any recommendations on where to start exactly to get on this path to find out more information about this, please leave a comment down below letting me know. Earth is round, not flat. Okay, Pastor Vlad, let's hear it. Common sense arguments that the Earth is not flat. Well, we have pictures of the Earth from space. First argument, false. The most famous photograph from space is the quote-unquote blue marble. A photograph of Earth taken on December 7, 1972 from 29,400 kilometers from the planet's surface. NASA's website will actually tell us how they made this image. And no, it's not a photograph. Type in Robert Simon, Mr. Blue Marble on Google and this link is going to pop up. This is straight from NASA.gov. He tells you his role is to make imagery from Earth science data. To make imagery. They don't take these photos. They make them. By 2002, we finally had enough data to make a snapshot of the entire Earth. The hard part was creating a flat map of the Earth's surface with four months of satellite data. By the way, all satellites are on balloons because there's no such thing as outer space. Then we wrapped the flat map around a ball. My part was integrating the surface, the clouds, the oceans to match people's expectations of how Earth looks from space. That ball became the famous blue marble. So there's NASA themselves telling you these are fake photographs that they created. Picture this, you're on the beach and you can see a ship gradually appear on the horizon. You can also enjoy watching the sunset. If you climb on the tree quickly, you'll be able to see the sunset all over again. Completely false. This is actually due to something called perspective, the law of perspective. The further something gets away, like these telephone poles, the shorter they're going to get and they're going to look like they're shrinking. And eventually it hits this vanishing point. But if you were to zoom in with the Nikon P1000 camera, you will see that it reappears. Same reason when airplanes fly overhead, they appear very high in the sky when they're right over you. But when they get further away, they get lower and lower. They appear to get lower and lower and then they actually disappear. Here are some boats that supposedly went over the curvature, but when he zooms in with this high powered camera, you can see they just reappeared. And the farther he zooms in, they all come into frame. None of them are even slightly uh, below the curvature. And these boats are all different distances away. Keep that in mind. Here's a video of the sun where it actually appears to already be setting on the horizon. But when you zoom in with the Nikon camera, as you can see, it starts to all come back into frame because it's actually just getting further away from you. It's not setting below anything. Um, we're not on a globe. The Earth is flat. And as you can see, as he zooms back out, it goes right back down. The reason why New York and London have different times is because it's a daytime in one place, it's a nighttime in the other. This happens because the Earth is round, not flat. The site Psalm 19 verse 4, in them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it. Right, so like the word says, the sun is going in a circuit, which is why he compared it to a strong man running a race. When you run a race in a racetrack, you go in circles. And the sun shines on one spot at a time, which is why we get night and day. 
Well, gravity pulls everything toward the center, making planets naturally form into a round shapes, not flat ones. This is the fundamental law of physics consistent throughout the universe. Just another blatant lie. Gravity is actually still a theory. It's never been proven as a fact. It is not a law. The reason this leaf falls to the ground when I drop it is because the leaf is more dense than the air that I dropped it in. But when it hits something that is more dense than the leaf, it's going to stop. This is the law of density and buoyancy. It has nothing to do with a magical force called gravity. So we've gone ahead and compiled all this into the True Earth book for you guys. So that way your mind can be free from the lies. You can download it right now in my profile. I'll see you guys in the next video. Shalom. That was a really cool way of breaking down flat earth, the globe earth theory, having someone explain why the earth is a globe and then stopping and explaining why the earth is actually flat. One of my biggest quarrels with this specific video, I guess, watching it, when he had the camera going towards the sun, the sun was becoming more in frame and it wasn't as, it wasn't, it was not setting as it appeared to be because he claimed that it was just going further away. But then a moment after that, he was saying that the sun spins in a circle around the flat earth. So how can someone capture the sun moving away as it's going away from someone and not going around? We should be able to see the sun going around and not away, I would think, right? If that makes any sense. That's like one of the only things that's kind of confusing me about this video is that doesn't really make sense to what he was saying about the distance of it going away from us if the sun is going around the flat earth. Let me know in the comments what you think. Maybe someone can explain it a little bit better so that I understand it a little bit more. Because under that logic, then it wouldn't make sense as he said it would. Have you ever heard of the Giants Causeway in Ireland? Well, someone asked me to check it out and see if I could use my investigative eyes and see what I could find. Oh, when I found it. You see, it has very unique rock formations. So unique that I really thought I'd be able to figure out what this really is. Because if you know my channel at all, you know I think that everything we walk on was once a living creature. And this is no different. So I asked myself, what has unique pattern, flesh, or skin, or scales like that? And it was really hard to deny how similar these rock patterns were to an armadillo. To an armadillo that just happens to have these funny little arms. And then, not to any surprise of my own, when I zoomed in on the Giant's Causeway, it was right there with its funny little arms. I don't know about you, but that's pretty hard to deny to me. I got news for you. We are ants living in a much, much, much bigger realm. And I just think there's a little protective dome over us keeping these giant monsters away from us. So next time you look up, thank God for that beautiful firmament above us, keeping us safe from all the monsters. But as always, guys, you know, I'm just here to entertain. This is just some total coincidence that there's a, you know, armadillo horse head looking thing here. Entertainment only. Before I get to the reference of it being an armadillo, I will say that the rock formations and everything of that area is really cool looking. I wish that that would happen in more areas because that looks really neat. And it does have some resemblance to an armadillo. He's not wrong when making that claim, but I kind of have my doubts. I also would really like to know, I know that he claims that he's a satire account for entertainment purposes, to keep TikTok from banning his content because TikTok has a big problem with deleting people's content when they're talking about these types of theories. So you have to make sure you let TikTok know that it's for entertainment purposes. But in reality, I wonder if he's really serious about some of these discoveries. Like yesterday's video I had of him showing us what looked like a snakehead, a very large one. And it really did look like a snakehead, so it's easy to believe. And it just makes me wonder, does he really go out finding the stuff and actually believing it? Or is he like, eh, you know, that kind of resembles an armadillo, so I'm going to make a video saying that that was a giant armadillo. Let me know in the comments what you think. Do you think that he's just setting up these videos for just playing content, which I have nothing wrong against it. I find it really entertaining myself. Or do you think he's actually serious? And again, I don't think there's nothing wrong with that either. Hey friends, 
So this document changed my perception of what UFOs actually are and where they're coming from. And I want to go over a few bullet points real quick and then I'll get into what I think about all this. So this document's from 1947 and it was declassified by the FBI. So let's just hit a few of these points real quick. So in the document, they say, they're talking about the flying saucers. They say, part of the disc carry crews, others are under remote control. Their mission is peaceful. The visitors contemplate settling on this plane. These visitors are human-like, but much larger in size. They are not excarnate earth people, but come from their own world. They do not um, come from any planet, as we would use the word, but from etheric planet, which interpenetrates with our own and is not perceptible to us. We're almost done. The bodies of the visitors and the craft also automatically uh, materialize on entering the vibratory rate of our dense matter. Um, we won't get into that. That's about their laser beams. <laughs> it's kind of scary stuff. But it says the region from which they come is not the astral plane, but corresponds to the locus or talus. Students of esoteric uh, matters will understand these terms. Locus and talus. So that's what I want to talk about now. So locus and talus is from ancient Hinduism and also theosophy. And what it talks about is the seven realms of the universe. So they split the universe into seven realms and each realm has, they're like bipolarized, right? So they have different polarities. So you have a kind of like a, a material and a spiritual realm. So the locus is the spiritual realm and the talus is the material realm, right? So there's seven levels to the universe, okay? This is where it gets super interesting because they're kind of nestled, they're, there's a hierarchy. So we're at the bottom level, right? So we're right here. And we can't really see or interact with anything outside of our level. But outside of our globe is what they call it, our world, our, our, we're at the densest bottom, uh, most material world. Outside of that is wrapped in these six other bubbles, okay? And when you go up, so say the bubble right above us, right, that, that talus, they can interact with us and everyone in their world, okay? And then you go up a notch, they can interact with everything below them, right? Then you go up and up and up. And as you go up, you get less dense, more into a light being. And then each one of these can descend to the level below it and the level below that and interact with those worlds if they want to, right? So this led me to uh, remembering what Tom DeLonge said one time. He had a classified briefing and he said that the way he was described what a UFO was is not a flying disc, but a submerging craft. So meaning that they, the same way we get into a submarine, right? So for us to go into the sea, we have to become more dense, okay? Because we have to sink into the sea. So a submarine actually has these like um, containers that fill up these, these compartments that fill up with water. When they fill up with water, it makes the submarine more dense and it sinks. Now for the submarine to come up, it lets that water out and then it floats up, okay? So that's how a submarine goes down into the, the sea. It doesn't swim down, it doesn't propel down, it sinks, it submerges. That's why it's called submarine, submerge, okay? So these UFOs, these crafts. So imagine we're here, this is our globe, and then there's a etheric realm around us. And now they have access to everything in their realm and everything below it, see? So if they want to go down, they have to become more dense. They have to sink, right? So these crafts, these Tic Tacs and these discs and these triangles and all these different crafts that we see, they're not flying here. It's not like they're coming from some other planet in, in, in you know, the universe and flying here physically. That's not the way things work when you get to this, this level of consciousness. So each of these realms above us is stacked on top of us. So they're not flying here from somewhere else. They are physically here. They're stacked on top of us. They just have to lower their density and sink into our realm. Does that make sense? It's crazy, huh? If you think about it. So we're all trying to like reverse engineer their propulsion system and trying to figure out like, how do they fly? What's their energy source? And this kind of stuff. It's going to be more like a Merkaba, right? A Merkaba is like, or Merkaba, however you say it, is basically two tetrahedrons, two pyramids, right? So you have one pyramid going this way and one pyramid coming down this way. They spin around in opposite directions. And I actually have a meditation. I'll do another video on a, a Merkaba meditation, which you can actually create this vehicle around your, your astral body so that you can safely travel through the astral realms in different dimensions. It's amazing. Now, this is how I believe these 
these beings in these higher astral, these higher dimensions, right? These other talas, how they come down in our worlds. They create these merkabas. These, they have to have like a ship. They have to have some sort of a craft, like the same way we go into the ocean. Like we can swim. We could just dive into the ocean and swim, but eventually it would get too dense and it would crush us. So we get into a submarine and the submarine safely carries us down into the ocean. That's how these beings are safely submerging themselves into our density here. So we're in the lowest density. Now, a real quick um, summary of what the Hindus and, and theosophy says about what this progression is, is that basically we start at the top and we're just pure light, right? We're, we're the absolute source consciousness. And each level that we go down, we descend down and we gain more materialistic stuff. We get more dense, we get more of a body, we get more belongings, we get more possessions, we get more things and we, we, we kind of fall down the ranks and when you get to the very lowest part where we're at now the job is to ascend that's why they call it ascension you have to ascend back up through the seven ranks till you reunite with source at the in the absolute at the top and then that's your loop that's your progression that's what we're doing here you have to you have to turn completely material and then you have to go back the other way that way you've learned everything you've experienced everything you've seen it from every single density every level you saw it on the way in and you saw it on the way out on the way out i would assume you're more appreciative and grateful and, and understanding of everything because you're seeing it from both sides anyways so knowing that there are these realms where these these like layers of an onion basically that go out these seven layers they are they can be described as a higher level of consciousness but they're also physical for for lack of better words, places where beings live. So in each of these realms, there are beings that live there. In each realm, each one up the peg is going to have different beings because they're a completely different density, a completely different um, like kind of phase of existence and consciousness. So, and then they're going to have different craft because they're just completely different. Each world is completely different, but they're stacked like those Russian dolls, you know? So as these different beings in these different realms, these different, you know, uh, tell us and logos as they are, um, like descending, I guess you say submerging into the levels below them, they have to use a Merkaba craft and their crafts are going to be different. And that's why we're seeing so many different kinds of crafts in the sky. Um, so many different kinds of beings, you know, some are glowing light, some are childlike, some are more robotic, some are more organic, some are more fluid, some are more ethereal, some are more physical, right? And then the crafts are different, you know, some are more organic, some are just light, you know, um, Merkaba, some are plasma. There are all sorts of different things because they're coming from these different realms. But what I think is the most fascinating is this paper that was declassified by the FBI talks about this. They talk about these flying saucers. This is from 1947, right after Roswell. They were, this was this, this paper that was classified and they're saying, Hey, these aren't crafts coming from other planets. These aren't aliens coming from other worlds. They're literally submerging. They're dropping, they're sinking from the densities above us. And this is all told in the Hindu teachings and theosophy. It's really wild stuff. And it makes a lot of sense. If you think about it, they are submarines. They're, they're etheric spiritual submarines. It's a way to, to, Increase your density because we're at the densest part here. So they can increase their density and sink through the different dimensions to get to us, right? And then they're like, ah, and then they <laughs> zip on out of here, right? That's why they just kind of appear and disappear like that, right? The same way we do in submarines. I'm sure there's sometimes like sharks and whales and fish and stuff. They're like, what the fuck is that? You know, they see a submarine. Think about a submarine. It's a tic-tac underwater. What do we see in the skies? Tic-tacs. They're submarines. Astral freaking submarines. What do y'all think about that? Have a beautiful day. This was probably one of the coolest ways to have UFOs broken down. With this information, I am now more of a believer in this form of aliens than anything and that form of technology. That actually makes a lot of sense. If there's another realm out there and all they need is equipment that can absorb enough density to sink into our realm, and just because they're beings from other realms, I don't necessarily believe that that makes them a spiritual being, like something from heaven or whatnot. I think that they are another part of our universe that exists along with us, and they just have better advancements than we do. To be able to construct a a piece of machinery that can gather density to go into another realm that's pretty advanced technology it also makes me wonder what do they look like in their realm and maybe the reason why they look all alien like in our realm is because that's how density formulates around them which makes me wonder what would we look like if we went to their realm it would probably change our appearance as well this was actually a really cool video i really like this a lot 
All right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and end this video here. As always, if you found any of these clips interesting, links are in the description down below. And with that being said, have a good day.